Hey students, okay, this is the video that I promised you. We're gonna talk about um, how to set up a self-modification project and you've been, um, uh, you've been introduced to it already. So let's take a look at, at the um, handout that's in your uh, uh, canvas. And uh, so we talked today this is Friday, by the way, um, February 5th, it's at 8.09. I may have to stop this at some point and uh, come back to it. But in the meantime, um, we talked today about the importance of defining your behavior that you wanna change in measurable terms. For example, if I said, I want you to get in good physical shape, right? Actually, that's what one of you had. And someone said, well, I want you to run. Well, how far are you gonna run? How fast are you gonna run? Where are you gonna run, right? If I said, um, uh, oh, let's see, what's a good one? Um, I want to um, I want to be more organized, right? So what would that mean? You got it, and you got a, a um, you got a taste of this when we talked about it earlier about the importance of you know if you're going to change your behavior, you got to be able to define it. Okay, so we'll, we're going to review that again uh, when we finish the rest of the groups on Monday. But in the meantime, let's take a look at our second step. Now, remember, these are seven steps. Define, reasons, journal, environment, reward, punish, and support. Okay, um, so the next step is reasons. This is a big deal. If you want to change something, and it's been difficult to change because your brain, you know, is having a problem with it. Your job is to come up with as many reasons as possible. We talked about that already. You know, I asked um, you, how many of you did, did weightlifting before, right? And so what happens is our brain then fights against us when we are in some degree of pain, discomfort, and so on. And our brain's going, I don't want to do this anymore, okay? so. Your challenge then is to come up with as many reasons as possible why you absolutely must overcome this problem, whatever it is, why you absolutely must start this be new behavior or stop this old behavior. And what you find is, uh, and the research is absolutely clear, and uh, Anthony Robbins talked about this, <coughs> The more reasons you can come up with a better, okay? So if that, for example, you want to graduate college, right? Why? Why do you want to graduate? What will it mean for you to walk across that stage and receive your diploma? What good things will come of that? Now look at it the other way. What negative things will come if you fail to do that? So I'm gonna give you um, something from Anthony Robbins called the rocking chair fantasy. And so it goes like this. I want you, uh, I know <clears throat> this may be hard because we're not in class right now doing this, but um, oh, you know what? Hmm. Maybe I'll wait to do this in class uh, because I think it's gonna be more effective if we can all, if we can all do this together. So will you remind me on uh, Monday after the quiz when um, and we get back into this to give you the rocking chair fantasy, all right? But basically it's a great way to understand that when we're working on something, if we come up with a lot of reasons, you know, all the good things that will come from doing this, and all the negative things that will come from not doing this, those reasons can drive us, right? So for example, here is, um, let's see. Yeah, so here is your contract, right? <clears throat> my contract. I, and then you're gonna put your name, will begin my self-modification project on the following date. Again, I'm not saying you have to do it, but what I'm saying is if you're gonna want a one point bonus, I want you to put together this contract so that if you ever do it, then you have you know this down. So there's the defining it in measurable terms. So what it says here is at least five reasons why I absolutely must be successful in this behavior change. What positive outcomes will result if I accomplish this behavior change? What negative outcomes <clears throat> will result if I fail to change? And in your 
<clears throat> one point bonus co contract, I want at least five, ideally 10, ideally a hundred, right? <clears throat> so here you are. You put together your list of all the reasons why you absolutely must get a four-year degree. And here you are working on some project, some homework, you know, whatever it is, and your brain's going, uh, let me out of here, right? And you pick up one of these and you start, you know, and <clears throat> going to a Snapchat or Facebook or whatever, right? <clears throat> and then you say to yourself, and you say, you ask your brain, why am I doing this? And you look over at your list and you have your list right here. And you look over and you go, yep, mm -hmm. yes, uh-huh, that's why I'm doing it. Yeah, uh, okay, all right, all right, I'll get back to it, right? Because what we find is that your brain, as we've talked about already, your brain doesn't like <clears throat> pain, discomfort, and so on. But if you can put up, if you can come up with enough reasons, your brain can get through most anything. So reasons, got it? Big deal, very important. When I read <clears throat> the aerobics book that I showed you today, it had in it reason after reason, the good things that would come from getting in physical shape. And so, you know, during these 50 years, actually it's, let's see, this June <laughs> God, will be 53 years that I've been running. Okay. And there were times, like I mentioned, I had knee problems or whatever. And so I had to ride a exercise bicycle or whatever. But, and there were times that, that I didn't run three times a week, almost all the time I do, but once in a while, twice a week or something happened. And then, you know, only once a week, but I get back to it. Right. And so why? Because there are all these reasons, all these good things that would come. My dad, I think I mentioned to you at age 52, had a massive stroke and almost died. You know, he always said to us kids, oh, please don't get a stroke. That is horrible, okay? My mom at 60, 66, 67 got cancer and she got a stroke too, right? So I got, I got a, some genes here that, you know, put me at risk for stroke. But what's going to minimize that? Being in physical shape, all right? So that's one of the reasons on my, you know, on my list, okay? Third, journal. Keep records of your progress. Now, early on, that's really important. Later on, it may not be such a big deal. Although, oh, geez, I have it right here. It's really amazing being at home where I can talk about something and pull it out, all right? So this is my, I just can't believe I'm showing this to you. <clears throat> this is my folder of my running records. See that? And so what it has in here is the times I used to take to run, to run a mile, to run two miles, to run my, you know, paths and all that, just to see, you know, how things are going as I've, as I've aged, right? And of course, <laughs> my times have slowed down. But the point is, you know, that's me keeping records of uh, how I'm doing, but, you know, I don't, I don't do it all the time. But for you, when you first start your project, uh, in most cases, it's very important that you keep a journal. If you're cutting down on sugar, how much sugar are you taking in each day? And you write it down, right? If you're talking about, you know, biting your fingernails, how often am I biting them, right? And what are the factors, you know, that as you'll read about in your, um, in your, Chapter, what are the antecedents that bring on, you know, more fingernail biting, okay? If you are on this too much, right? Spending too much time, mm, 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 you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Which is, isn't this a great example of intermittent reinforcement? Where you're going like this because you think the next one, the next uh, one is gonna give you something interesting. You're gonna see something interesting. So yeah, that's you know another great example of intermittent reinforcement. And as we speak right now, as I'm talking to you right now, there are millions of people all over the world who can't put this thing down, okay? And so if you're spending too much time on it, right? You don't want to be an old person. We're going to talk about this later when we get to loss. You don't want to be an old person on your deathbed saying, you know, I should have spent more time on this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, 
That's not what you want. That's not what people say. Got it? So journal. Write down your progress each time that you're doing it. So you can see it, whether it's, um, you know, stopping smoking or, you know, any of that. Um, and again, as I talked about, about 17% 17, 17 of the population of this country still smokes. What about vaping? Right? You know, another uh, example of, you know, people who realize, you know, I started this and now I'm, huh, I'm really addicted. So, you know, how are you going to get off of it? So let's take a look at <coughs> an example of how you might keep track of something, you know, oh, let's say like, um, like smoking or something. Come, that's not giving me a hash mark here. Let's try this again. Okay, and so here are, here are days, all right? This is time on this part of the graph. This is not the bell curve. Okay. But it's days. And so let's say, you know, um, you and I smoke cigarettes. Okay. And then an average day, we smoke, um, oh, let's say a, a pack and a half, which is what, 30, um, 30 cigarettes, right? And so here I've decided, you know, I'm going to cut down. Maybe I'm using the patch or nicotine gum or <laughs> vaping, which, you know, that's how they initially presented it. That vaping will help you stop smoking, but it'll also keep you addicted to nicotine. Okay. So over here, <coughs> so over here is number of cigarettes, right? And down here is days, right? So what do we have here? Here's day one, okay. day one, day two, and so on, got it? And so the question is, how many cigarettes did I smoke on day one? And maybe I cut down a little bit, and so I put a little mark right here. this. And so here I have, why don't they show up? Issue with that. Let's see if that little mark will work. Okay. And so there I am on uh, day one, I smoked 29 cigarettes, right? And day two and day three and four and five. So what you can do is just, you know, start to look at your progress as the days go by. And what you hope is that, you know, that you know, this, this line here is going to um, eventually go down as we sort of piece it together here. Got it? Okay. Um, or if we're talking about being nice to your brother, then uh, we can keep track of uh, how many positive little things that you do with your brother and how many negative things that you do. But the point is, that for many people, they fail in their project because they did not keep a journal. For some people, they're, you know, they're trying to reduce their caloric intake, you know, they're trying to lose weight and so on, which is, you know, as everyone says, it's so easy to put it on and so hard to take it off. And so, you know, what if you really uh, want to do this, you need to be honest with yourself. What are you putting in here? every day so you're keeping track of exactly you know what you're eating the helpings you know there's great uh apps and websites now that you can go on that will tell you exactly how many calories something happens you go to costco and you you buy a a slice of um, pizza you know or winco uh, you can look that up and it'll tell you costco pizza here's how many calories it has or carbs or whatever it is you're trying to control okay so i know i'm belaboring this point but this is a big deal you need to keep track of what you're doing because quite often what people do with um, especially trying to reduce their caloric intake um, talking about calories um, is after a while they just they don't write it down anymore and that's the kiss of death okay all right second i mean fourth is setting up your environment for success so get that down that's a big deal what does my environment look like 
So if we were in the classroom right now, I'd have you turn to someone and I would have you ask that person, what does your study area look like when you're studying for psychology? You study at the kitchen table, you study in your bed, you study on the floor, study in your car. Where do you study? And where, where's most effective for you? Okay. What is your environment like? And the question is, is it working for you? When, um, so a couple of little stories about this. When I was um, the, when I was a student at Highline story, the library used to be in building six where registration is. And so I would go in there, I had a bunch of friends on campus because you know, we who could not get into the UW ended up at Highline. And so I knew, I knew quite a, quite a few people. And um, so I'd walk into the library and I would then find a table and I would sit at the table, find a table, so I could face over in a particular direction. What direction? So I could see people walking in the door of the library, at sliding doors. Why? Well, then they'd come and sit at my table. And then what? I wouldn't have to study. You got it? And so, Guess what? My grades suffered because I was not in a, an environment that you know was conducive to studying. So the next quarter, I you know looked around the library and I found something called a study carol. What? Study carol, C A R R E L. Maybe there's two L's. Well, what's a study carol? Study Carol is a place quite often in the library where you walk up to it and it has little walls here. It has a desk right here, you know, right here, and the wall is here. So you don't see anything. It is the most boring place you can think of. And so here then you go. And so for me, the next quarter I would walk in the library and I'd see a couple of my friends sitting at a table. Hey, Bob, come on over. Uh, no, and I remember there were times when I would walk past my friends who were beckoning to me, heading toward this boring place. And I could, like my legs, I could hardly I'd lift them up to go to this boring place. But you know what? Once I got settled, I opened up my book, started working on it, you know, I started focusing and my grades gradually got better. Okay. So, unfortunately, some of my friends' grades didn't, and you know, they kind of flunked out of Highline. Okay. And so, you know, the sad thing today is, you know, I keep showing you this little thing, but let me show you the one that I have for. Yeah, here we go. You have a problem with this invention when you try to study. You know that because you put it, you know, right down over here, you know, right next to you here, okay? And here you are studying away and then it's easy to pick it up and suddenly you're in the whole world, right? And so the question becomes, when you sit down to study, could you, make sure I'm plugged in here, make sure to put it in your backpack. Now, you couldn't do that, could you? Of course not, because this is part of you, right? You have to have it right next to you all the time. Yeah. So what's the point here? How are you setting up your environment? Are you in a place that has a lot of noise? Um, is there a library near you that's open that maybe um, you know that's where you can go? Is there another room that you should be going into? What about music? What I'm going to say about music, you're going to be surprised. Okay, you know, <laughs> there's my music. In fact, I don't know if you can see all of it. See, there it all is. There about 400 CDs, um, you know, that uh, I've accumulated over the years. <clears throat> Uh, some, someone in my, uh, I think it was a human relations class today, asked me if I liked One Direction. I said, yes. The moment I heard One Direction like 10 years ago, I said, that group is going to be very famous. And then, unfortunately, like a lot of group, you know, they're gone. Okay. So, music. Go ahead and study 
with your music, but be honest with yourself. Music is part of your environment. That's number four here, right? But be honest with yourself and ask yourself, with this music going on in the background, am I able to concentrate? If you can, fine. If you can't, either turn off your music or find some other music. You know, I'm here, this is my office space here that I'm sitting at right now. And I do a lot here. And, uh, you know, one of the things I do is I correct your exams. <laughs> oh, so much fun. Um, and what happens when I correct your exams? I put in one of my CDs and I just blast the music because I don't have to think. Don't take it personally when I correct your exams. I just, that's wrong. That's good. And just go on and slashing it all up, right? However, when I'm asked to, for example, I sat on someone's class recently because I'm on a committee to evaluate this person's teaching. And so I took notes. So now I have to type up those notes. And so what I do is I have my music on and if that music is interfering with my ability to translate those notes into you know, this document, then I either change my music or I turn it off. Got it? So go ahead, you decide whether your music's gonna work for you. The thing that I don't think can ever work for you is the television, right? Having the television on because what we know is that we can really only concentrate on one thing at a time. So you're either reading and concentrating on that or, or two seconds later, it's pulling you away because there's something interesting on television. And so, you know, if that's you know, one of the ways that you've um, set up your environment, you really need to ask yourself, is, is that the case, okay? All right, here's another one. Um, oh, I wish we were in a classroom now. I want you to ask yourself, where's my homework? especially if you've attended college or even high school or whatever, when you came home at night with your backpack, the question is where, when you walk in the door, did you put your backpack, right? For most people, as soon as they walk in, their homework's inside of their backpack, I don't wanna look at it, okay? So get this down. Here's a way to think about this that when you come home from school or when you are in your study area, open up your homework you know, for one of your classes and have it all ready to go. So you come home, you unzip your backpack, you take out the homework, you set it up. Let's say you have you know, 18 math problems that you have to do for tomorrow. Now, Maybe for a few of you like, oh, wow, I am so excited. Let's open up that math book and plunge right in. But for a lot of people, they put it off, right? They come home, 7.30, they've had, they've had dinner. They, you know, got to text some people, got to check what's going on here, right? Now it's 9.15. Okay, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. And then it's 10. 10.20, pretty soon it's 11.30 and your brain's going, oh, I gotta start it. Why do you have to start it? Because the punishment now is so great. Now it's 11.30 and you're thinking, I'm gonna be up till 2.30 in the morning. Of course, you've never done that, but you know someone who's done that, right? You know, this whole procrastination thing. So what am I talking about? When you first get home, don't drop your butt backpack. Or if you're, you know, someplace where you normally do your homework, open up your homework and have it all ready to go. And you're, as you're doing this, your brain's going, no, I don't want to look at it. It's, oh, it's too painful, right? But instead, what you do is you say to your brain, I'm not going to do this now. I'm just going to have it opened up, ready to go. So you open up your math book to page 127. You, uh, maybe you're doing this online or however you're doing it, you have it all ready to roll. And then you go and do some things. But the point is, every time you walk by, now your math book is calling out to you. Hey, I'm over here, right? And so the whole idea is, you know, it's ready to go. So when I have things that aren't really fun to do, I have it right next to me to remind me, you got to get this thing done. The worst thing you do 
is you have this trapped in your backpack. You know, it's almost like your homework is inside your backpack going, help, let me out, I'm trapped in here, right? And so let me give you another trick because this is, a, you know, as we're going through this, these are tricks we can play on your brain to help prevent the big P, procrastination, okay? You know, define that behavior, come up with reasons, journal your results, you know, set up your environment for success, okay? So here's a way to think about this. So you got 18 math problems and you say to yourself, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna do four math problems. That's it. Now, when you say the, that to your brain, your brain goes, yeah, okay, I can do four. That won't take that long, right? So you're on the computer, you're writing it out, whatever you're doing, and pretty soon you got the four done. Then you go, huh, if I do two more, I'll be one third done. Okay, I can do two more, yeah. Now you're at six. All right, maybe I'll do a couple more and then I can get like half done. That would be great. And pretty soon you're at nine or 10 or whatever. And it's like, okay, just a, maybe a couple more. Now you're at 12. Now I'm two thirds done. All right, let me just, I can stop anytime. I know that I can stop any, see what's going on? How many of you have done that before, right? You're tricking your brain because if you say to your brain instead, I have to sit down and do 18 math problems or read 43 pages in my US history book. Your brain will go later. Got it? So these are little ways that you can then set up your environment for success. So what are we talking about here? As it says right here, it says create positive pressure. When we have pressure, it motivates us to do something. Think of the last time that you had to go to the bathroom and you said to your body, not now, okay? I got, I got something to do. And gradually your body began talking to you louder and louder. And pretty soon your, your body is saying, you need to go now. What is that? That's pressure, right? And so in getting this self-modification thing done, you need to set up your environment in a way that's going to, you know, have some pressure. I have my running shoes, my running shorts, socks right next to my bed. So on, so this week I ran um, Tuesday, Friday, I'm going to run Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday. Is that right? Yeah. And so, um, <clears throat> on Tuesday, was it Tuesday? Yeah. So on Tuesday, um, you know, alarm goes off about 6.30, although I was awake anyway, get out of bed, put it on, it's dark, you know, and so on, right? But it's right there. Can you imagine that like, if, if I had them in the closet, I gotta go to my closet, where are they? Oh, I'll go to the drawer, pull out my socks, here's my running, right? No, right there, okay? And so that's the question for you. Are you setting yourself, your life up for success or failure? And so those things you need to get done, you need to have right in your face, easy to get to. Got it? Okay. So environment, big deal. Next, we know this is coming, of course. Reward. Reward our good behavior. Okay. And then you see what's coming after that. But what are we talking about with reward? A lot of people go, well, to get it done, that's enough reward. But the problem is, if you're not getting it done, that end reward product isn't, isn't working, right? And so there are little techniques that we can use to reward ourselves. Because if you're not getting this done, if you haven't started writing that book, and you're still not being nice to your brother and helping your mother around the house and so on, Okay, or you know, doing any of these things, starting your exercise program, then it ain't working, right? Okay, so you see here a term called the PREMAC principle. PREMAC principle, let's talk about that. Named after a guy, 
Okay, it's, that's why it's a capital P. If you look at the word, it's not going to tell you anything because this guy's name was Premac. So let's talk about what it is. And my guess is you've probably done this before um, and didn't know what it was called in psychology. Okay, so let's get down the definition. Well, no, let, let, let me give you an example first, and then like I did in a couple of these, and then we'll go through a definition, okay? So example is the following. 10-year-old girl comes home from school, comes in the house. Hi, mom. Oh, you're home from school? Okay. Hey, mom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and play. And her mother goes, well, honey, you need to practice your piano. Remember you need to do that for a half hour? Oh, okay, mom. Well, can I play for a while and then come and do my piano? Is that the pre-mac principle? No. What would her mother say to her? You know what her mother would say. Same thing your mother would say. Practice your piano first, and then you can play. So get that down. And it goes like this. In order for her to play, she must first practice her piano. Got it? So, so get that down and then let's come up with a general definition and see how we can make that work for us. So pre-MAC principle goes like this. In order for me to do what I want to do, like, you know, gaming or whatever, right? I must first do what I'm supposed to do. Got it? In order for me to do what I want to do, I must first do what I'm supposed to do. So sometimes I'll come home and, you know, I'll have been teaching um, maybe two human relations classes. Let's see, is that what I'm doing next quarter? Yeah, I'm gonna do two of these next quarter. I'm also teaching a class, I think I mentioned to you, called Death Across Cultures. It's a five credit class. So here I come home uh, from teaching two classes of um, human relations and I have, you know, 58 quizzes to correct. As you might guess, I don't say, I love correcting quizzes. No. I'm like, oh, no, I got quizzes. I want to get them back to them tomorrow. So I, you know, I come home, I eat some dinner, and then I'm faced with these 58 quizzes. But I want to have some dessert, right? Now, what is one of my favorite desserts? Ice cream. Yeah, you know, I think ice cream is much too cheap. You know, they sell, what is it? A quart and a half of ice cream or whatever it is for four bucks, five bucks. I think ice cream should be like 12 or $15, right? It's so good, but you know, don't tell them that, right? So what do I do? I say to myself, oh yeah, I got 58 quizzes. You know, tell you what, I'm going to, if I can get through one class through 29, quizzes, then uh, I'll eat my ice cream. Got it? I like to do 58, but whew, that's just too much. So after about, you know, correcting my 20th quiz, I go and get out the ice cream, you know, dish it up, put it in there, because I kind of like my ice cream melted. How many of you like ice cream melted, right? <laughs> Some of you like hard ice cream, that's fine, but I, I kind of melt it, like, not like total liquid, but, you know, kind of soft, right? So on my 20th quiz, then I get to get up and, right, okay? And then, you know, by the time I get to quiz number 29, it's like, okay, I get to eat my ice cream, got it? Or maybe I keep pushing, like I have that little trick. Maybe I get to 35 and then 41. It's like, heck, you know, 17 more and I'm, right? And I finish up and boom, I eat my ice cream. So that's what it is. It says, in order for me to have something that I want, like some reward, I must first do what I'm supposed to do. When I was in my doctoral program, I had to write a big paper called a major area paper, doing all this research, all, you know, all this literature review and all that and put it all together and boom, okay? And so I made a deal with myself. I'm not going to have dessert anymore until I finish this major area paper, which typically takes months to do. And there's some people take years to do. 
but you know, that wasn't going to happen to me, but this is an important part of the doctoral program. And so I don't know what it took three months or whatever. And I love sweets, right? Do you love sweets? Like, I mean, I have a sweet tooth that's, you know, um, probably too much. And most of my siblings, except one of them, they love sweets as well. We go to, to you know, the buffet somewhere and, you know, my sisters come back with you know, all these sweets going on, right? So, <clears throat> so I, um, that, that day that I passed it in, and my professor uh, took my family out. We went to Dairy Queen and I had like, like a banana split, you know, like this big and everyone else had ice cream and so on as, as a celebration. Now, that was a very long, long pre-Mac principle because what did I say to myself? In order for me to have any sweets, I must first finish this paper. Got it? And so Anytime you do something like that, it's a good thing. Here's something simple. You have, let's say you have um, three classes and one of them you really like is a fun class. You really, you know, the homework isn't that big a deal and so on. And the other class is like, oh, it's hard to do. So tonight you have homework for two of those classes. The one you really don't like and the one you like a lot. Which homework should you do first? Yes, do the tough one first. What does pre-Mac principles say? In order for me to have what I want, that is to do the easy homework, I must first do the hard homework. Have you done that before? Of course you have. What is it called? Pre-Mac principle. And so we set up our environment in ways then to make these things happen by saying to myself, let me get this thing done and then I'll do that, okay? My wife and I, um, you know, we'll watch uh, something on TV in the evening and I'll say, well, let me get my exams corrected. You know, it might be 8.30, 9 o'clock or so, but um, when I get them done, then, you know, let's watch. And she understands that. And, you know, cause I don't want to sit there watching TV going, oh geez, I don't watch TV. And then I'm going to go have to do this thing that's waiting for me. Got it? Pre-Mac principle. Uh, um, and, uh, and I'm going to give you some um, group work on that. All right. Um, related to that, you see the word reward are tokens, tokens. So you read about token economy in your book, right? And so what we're talking about is that in, in a, a self-modification project, you may want to set it up. So every day that you are successful, you take a dollar and you put it in the jar, okay? You now I have some jar, some bowl, something where you can see that money in there right? And you take a dollar and really actually get a dollar and put it in there. Don't just say, you know, I'll, you know, I'll do it at some point. It's actually keeping track of that, right? And then, and you can see that in your, um, says number six right here. In addition, I will put blank dollars in my jar for each successful day. When I have accumulated so many dollars, I will purchase blank, okay? So what's going on here is that you say to yourself, okay, let's say I put a dollar in the jar and after 30 days, yeah, after 30 days, I, if I'm successful, I got 30 bucks. Hmm, what can I buy for $30 that I really would just go out and buy right away, but that would be a nice thing for me, right? you know, some game, some, you know, something, article of clothing, you know, whatever it is that, you know, and you say, yeah, I want to get that. So you go on Amazon or whatever it is that you are going to order and you have deserved this because you were good for those 30 days. Now, what if you screw up one day, you don't pull a dollar out, you just don't put the dollar in. Got it? So that's another way of rewarding yourself with the little things, you know, a token where you, and why is a dollar considered a token? Because a dollar, you know, in and of itself is nothing, right? I mean, you're going to sit there and look at George Washington and go, oh, this feels great, okay, right? It's what you can do with that dollar. So money is a token. It is. In and of itself, you can't do anything with it. But if you then trade it in for whatever it is, you know, you'll get something, right? Okay, let's take a look next at the other side of it, which is punishing oneself, okay? Now, as I've been lecturing on this for years, I think I have one, yeah. Uh, one of my students said, 
uh, and this happened more than once, raised her hand and said, uh, yeah, I have a friend who um, tried to stop smoking. And so what he did to punish himself, he would take a rubber band and he would put it on his wrist and <clears throat> every time he smoked a cigarette, yes, he'd, you know, snap himself, you know, never works. Ne never turned one person. Yep. I stopped smoking with the rubber band trick, right? Doesn't work. And so the point here is to say to yourself, what little things can I do to punish myself if I fail today to do this thing, whatever this thing is, okay? You know, tomorrow's Saturday, then on Sunday I'm supposed to run and, excuse me, if I'm first starting this modification project and I fail to run, then I punish myself, all right? Well, what are we talking about? We're not talking, you know, punch yourself in the face every time you swear or whatever you're trying to do, right, okay? So as it says here, one of the ways to do that is to punish yourself by depriving yourself of something that you like, okay? Now, we're not talking about skipping an entire meal or something, but something that you like. Maybe you like, you know, visiting some place on here that's really fun, or you like playing, you know, a particular game on here. So you say to yourself, okay, if, I am not successful today of doing this thing I'm supposed to do. Then tomorrow, no games, okay? Or no visiting whatever this site is that I, that I love visiting. No TikTok, right? So, got it? So what are you doing? You're depriving yourself of something because you didn't stick to your contract, okay? Here's one. How many of you are like me and you love, I mean, love music, right? And whenever I ask this to student, all these hands go up, right? I mean, music is just so amazing. And, you know, I've been fortunate as I got my old music from, you know, the olden days that my kids came along, you know, and the 80s and 90s and then their music and so um, I really uh, been fortunate that I have a lot of um, years of music that I can enjoy right and so you make this agreement with yourself if I don't if I fail to do what I'm supposed to do today tomorrow I go without music especially you know when you're riding in a car every day okay if you're like me, the person who's driving gets to, you know, choose the music. Well, tomorrow you drive in silence. No, oh no, right? That could be a punishment for someone. Got it? All right. Now the next one I'm gonna give you. Oh, I wish we were in the classroom now. You're not gonna like it all. But if you're really motivated, to change this behavior, here is a way that can highly motivate you. It's a form of punishment and it goes like this. Here you are, you're working on this project, you've been successful every day, but you've made an agreement to yourself. If I am not successful one day, I will go online and find an organization that I hate. And then I'm going to donate $1 to that organization. You don't like the KKK? You, you're not really happy with the Proud Boys, right? You don't dig QAnon? Okay. You don't like our, our present president or the former president? One dollar donation to, I told you you wouldn't like it, right? So what's going on here? If that can motivate you, then great. You know, so here, right? <laughs> Sorry, you've donated to the KKK and they send you an email. Congratulations, thank you so much. You are now an honor, <laughs> sorry, an honorary member of the KKK, right? You're going, no, no, I don't want to be. Well, 
If you could stick to your contract, you wouldn't have to worry about this now, would you? Okay. So punishment, as we know, can motivate us to get things done. And if you're really focused on being successful in this project, then you can include this form of punishment by, by donating to a place you hate. Got it? Okay. Number seven is support. What are we talking about? We're talking about social support. Meaning, as I mentioned before, remember we went through the seven, the six um, um, perspectives of human um, being human, right? And one of them was social. And so what we're talking about here is ideally, when you're trying to change your behavior, you have one person, at least one person in your life who can support you. Now, here is the trick. You see it and you see it there. It says, ask the people around you for support, but they cannot, and get this in large letters, they cannot punish you when you go off your contract. Got it? They cannot punish you. They can only reinforce you. They can talk to you about it, but they are not allowed to beat you up. Because guess what? We beat our own selves up pretty bad. So like I told you, I think it was today, right? That um, I met my wife when she was 16 and I was 30. No, no, that's right. I was 19, okay? And she was already, like I mentioned to you before, on a diet, right? Now, look at that word, it's <laughs> diet. I take a look at that word. The first three letters give it away, right? Don't go on a diet because at some point you're gonna go off the diet. Instead, what you're going to do is modify your behavior. Okay? In other words, you're going to change the kinds of things or how many of those things that you put in your mouth. And that's tough. I'm lucky. I did not have to worry about my diet till a few years ago. I was diagnosed with diabetes. So I got to pay attention to what's going on and keep track of my numbers and all that kind of stuff. But it's not as bad as I know for most people trying to lose weight, which my wife has you know, dealt with most of her life, right? And a lot of people have. In fact, more than ever before, more people are considered obese than ever before, what 30% of all adult, adults. And you even see some kids who are already on their way and that's just, that's scary, scary stuff, okay? All right, so um, here we were. We'd been married at that point, um, let's see. 73, yeah, about four years, okay? And so she was, you know, on a diet again, and uh, I think it was Weight Watchers or whatever. And so she was working uh, downtown um, at the IRS building. And so she'd take the bus and my daughter and I would meet her. We lived in West Seattle at the time when she got off the bus. And uh, we'd walk home and, then, and I'd sit down and say, well, how, you know, how's your day? And then how is your diet doing? And, you know, she'd tell me. And after a couple of weeks of this, one day she came home and she said, said uh, you need to sit down. I said, okay, what's going on? She said, I have something to tell you. And I said, what? She said, I've been cheating. I said, what's his name? No, not that, not that. What? Well, I've been eating candy bars at work. What? You've been eating candy bars? You're like ruining our, our diet. Can you believe, what are you doing? Did you hear that word that I slipped in there? Whose diet did I say? Yeah, our diet. Whose diet is it? Hers, right? So I finally kind of calmed myself down. I mean, I love this woman, right? And I want her to be successful, but I got emotionally involved in it. And I jumped on her and she felt bad enough herself. She didn't need me to do that. What she needed me to say was, well, tell me about it. What's going on? 
you know, eventually she did. She said, yeah, here I'm at work and I walk down the hallway. It's 10 o'clock, I got a short break and I walk by the candy machine. And back then you could put a quarter in there and, you know, get some candy bar. So I'd get it and eat it. And then of course feel guilty. And then I had lunch and then after lunch, see it again. And maybe sometime later on in the afternoon, another break. And so I come home and I'm, I'm lying to you, right? Which is how much does that help? Okay. And so I realized I needed to let go of it. Let go of punishing her to, re, you know, reinforce her when she's able to say no to some of those tough foods, right? That she needs to keep away from. But that's your job as well. If you're going to support a person, your job is to not punish them. So here's an example I give. Let's say you have a friend who has decided no cake. I love cake too much. I, I, I'm not going to eat any cake, you know, for the next year or whatever it is. That's just going to help me, you know, re reduce my sugar and caloric um, uh, input. Okay. So tomorrow you and your friend go to a wedding and you're at the wedding reception and the couple is cutting the cake, right? We've seen all that before. And now here's all these plates of cake then sitting there and people are going up to get it. And you, you suddenly look up and you see your friend. Start walking toward the cake, right? And you're thinking, oh no. And you go and tackle the guy and drag him back and all that and say, you're not gonna do that. You can't. He brings back three plates of cake. Now you can say, are you really gonna eat that? Um, you know, it's, I mean, it's up to you, but you know, you said you were gonna try to, and maybe your friend goes, well, okay. Or the friend goes, no, I'm eating it, right? And then afterwards, how are you feeling? Stupid, why did I do this? It was so good though, right? Or instead you see your friend get up, walk over, talk to the bride and groom, look at the cake, turn around and walk away. And you go up to your friend, put your arm around, how you doing? Oh, I'm dying here. You, congratulations, I can't believe you did that. You walked away from that cake, right? Why not punish him? Because in a couple weeks, he's gonna go to another wedding and you're not gonna be there. He's gonna, he has to do this alone, but with support for people who are gonna reward him. So one more time, don't punish, you know, support that person if they screw up, but your job is not to beat them up. There's another organization. Do you know what this is? Have you heard this one before? I think we mentioned it today. It's called, it goes by two letters, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. What is it based on? Social support. You go to an AA meeting and people stand up, tell, say their first name and tell you how long it's been since their last drink. Powerful stuff. Some people end up going to AA meetings two, three times a week to get that support. Do I have that book here? I think I left it at school. No, there was a book, no, I was at school today and I thought about pulling that off my shelf, but there's a book that was written by a guy named Bill. Um, I don't know. 50 years ago now, it's called The Book. And it's a 12 step program, okay? And you get a sponsor, you get someone who you can text, call, contact at 3.30 in the morning and say, I'm just ready to have my drink, right? Also NA, Narcotics Anonymous, same thing. Make a note that what we know is that about 5% of all people who drink will end up with alcohol problems. That is huge. If we know that there's more than 300 million people in this country 
that's more than 15 million people every day who are coping with not taking a drink. That's got to be tough, not just every day, every moment of every day to abstain from this. And so AA, it isn't perfect. Some people start it and they fail and so on. But for some people, you know, that keeps them honest and, you know, going to the meetings is very helpful. So relax for a moment, a little story about this. This is about, what, 12 or so years ago. Uh, one of my students who comes and visits me once or twice a year, he actually took my class now 30 years ago. Um, but once or twice a year, he'd just show up and how you doing? And we'd talk and catch up. And then he, you know, got another job or got married or whatever, right? So about 12 years ago, he comes to my office. I go, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. He goes, yeah. He says, look, I got something to tell you. I said, what? He said, I'm an alcoholic. I said, what? I never knew you drank. He said, no, I never drank when I went to school. Um, but, but I did. And I... Um, at other times, and I have problems. And three years ago, I joined AA. I go, really? How's it going? He said, I haven't had a drink in three years. And he said, uh, in a couple weeks, they're going to give me a three-year coin. Okay, I don't think I've got it here. Do I have any here? Let's see. Um, no. Um, and he said, when they do this, it's you know like an award ceremony, you know, talking about reward. Um, and I need a, a couple people to come and say a few words about me. And I wonder if you would do that. You've known me all these years. I go, sure, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I said, where is it? He said, it's in Burien. He gave me directions for it. So a couple of weeks later, I get my car, I drive over to Burien, find the place, go inside. There's like 30 people sitting there. There's my student. Hi, come on over, sit down and introduce me to a couple of people and so on. So they, you know, start the meeting and um, uh, this guy says, okay, we've come to the point now we're going to give awards. So we have um, uh, this person here, Frank, who's um, 20 years. And so let's, um, let's hear it for Frank and everyone's applauding and so on. And here we have Sylvia. Um, she's 15 years and a couple other people in 10 years and five. Then they get to my student and other couple, couple people who three years. And so I, you know, talk to the group and say, you know, hey, um, he was my student for um, and comes and visits me and so on. And so he told me about this and I'm really proud of him. And then another guy got up and he said, pointed to my student and he said, you know, when he first came here, I thought he's not gonna do it. And here he is today, my student is just standing there just beaming, you know, right? Um, so a couple weeks later, my student shows up in my office again and he goes here and he hands me the coin. I said, I, I, I can't have this coin. You're the one who, who did it. He said, no, I'm, I'm supposed to give it away and I'd like to give it to you. So I've had that coin in my office for 12 years. Sitting used to sit on my, my phone. I thought I brought it home, but if I did, it would have been right here. So no, nope, not showing up here. Um, to remind me the power, right, of something like AA with this amazing social support. And I got one more little piece for you. You know, I told you the guy who wrote the book, the 12 step program for AA, his name is Bill. My wife and I have been over the years on a number of cruises, right? The big ship, you know, like a floating hotel. And every day on the cruise, they give a list of things to do, okay? And how do they, how do they do it? Bill's group thing. So like usually at two o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon, among other things, ping pong and, you know, all this stuff to do. It says Bill's group, two o'clock. Now, most people are like, okay, that's Bill. I don't know who Bill is. That means that there is an AA meeting on that ship, right? For people to meet because there's alcohol all over the ship, right? and to still have an AA meeting in the middle of the ocean, because guess what? That may be the time when you're most tempted. Ah, away from home, heck, why not, right? So Bill W, that's his name, Bill W's group, all right? So that's a powerful example of what social support can do. As I mentioned before, 
you know, whatever you're doing to try to better your life, you need at least that one person there who's going to support you, who's going to say you can do it. You know, when I um, applied for uh, my master's degree and got accepted to Fresno, you know, we um, packed up this trailer and, you know, moved down to Fresno. And then I taught for nine years and I decided then to go for my doc my doctorate and got accepted to Peabody College of Vanderbilt University and, you know, drove this big, you know, rider truck 2,500 miles. And my wife and kids said, okay, we're going to do this. And we ended up, you know, going to Nashville, Tennessee, a place that we never been before. And, you know, for those of you who've done something like that, where you've had to move and you cry when you leave, because I, my kids left their four grandparents and so on. And then when we, you know, left Nashville four years later, we cried when we left, okay? Support. My wife said, let's do it. And so important, you know, I give a lot of workshops um, all over the place. And sometimes people come up to me and say, wow, you really do a lot. And I, I met your wife and I, I see how you can do it now. She's the one behind you, isn't she? Go, oh, absolutely. I could not do it without her support in so many ways. And that's what you need in life. Someone who's going to say, I'm here for you. Let's do it, whatever it is. Got that? So support, that is a crucial um, facet of this. But the important thing is that you do not punish. Okay. All right. So you are actually in a position now, um, now that we've gone through this, to pick one of those topics and then uh, go on Canvas and you'll be able to pull this up and begin to fill in these blanks, okay? The place, as I told you before, where people fall down is that they do not define their behavior in measurable terms. In fact, I'd really like you to maybe wait till Tuesday because we're going to have more practice on defining our behavior in measurable terms. And why am I pushing you on that? Because, you know, then I have to give it back to you, then you give it back to me. Now we finally got it. And I want you to get this right the first time, both for you and me. Okay. And then sometimes people only put two or three reasons. No, I want at least five reasons why you absolutely must overcome this problem. Okay. Um, let's see. And then to help my success, how are you gonna set up your environment? What's that's gonna look like? Each time, hour a day that you're successful, how are you gonna reward yourself with some little thing? It could be you know, putting the dollar in the jar or you know, finding some way to you know, pat yourself on the back, right? And each day I'm not successful, I will punish myself by not allowing myself to what? What is that, okay? And if I'm not successful in my attempt to change this behavior, here's what I will do. Maybe you're going to wait a year. Maybe you're not ready to change this behavior. And then you have two people's names that you uh, put in here who, if this were in the classroom, I'd have them sign it actually, um, that have looked over this contract and then have given their support by signing it there. Got that? Okay. So that is, um, I, that's probably um, a good place for us to stop. So let's see, let's get out of this full screen here and don't have to, okay. So let, I will uh, post this tomorrow morning. So you should be able to get this um, on uh, February 6th. If you then have a problem uh, of you know, finding it and so on, will you email me so I can check that out and see what's going on here, okay? So let's see, let me stop this recording. You're gonna hear this little voice saying, the recording has stopped.